So, so we're going to get started. Uh, this is Anthony Alaka with Torrey Hills Capital. I want to welcome everyone to the Venture Point Diagnostics podcast for uh, June 10th, 2021. I hope everyone's doing well under the circumstances, and I want to thank you all uh, for attending today's virtual presentation. All of you are familiar with VenturePoint Diagnostics. Many of you own the stock. Uh, we started working with VenturePoint back in September of 2020. And since then, George Adams and his team have done a tremendous job of delivering on milestones and other positive developments. And we feel that even though the stock has performed well over the past seven months, we're really just getting started in terms of the upside potential in the stock. And I wanted to take this opportunity to reconnect everyone with VenturePoint Diagnostics, um, give everyone an update and really highlight the company's recent progress and key announcements uh, that have set the company up for long-term success. Uh, as you all know, VenturePoint trades on the OTC market under the ticker VPTDF and on the TSX Venture Exchange under the ticker symbol VPT. Uh, shares are trading uh, roughly uh, with a Canadian market cap of uh, 60 million. Uh, and the stock has pulled back a little bit more uh, than 30% since it hit a high in April. Uh, and we feel it presents a, a tremendous opportunity for investors looking for a long-term uh, growth investment opportunity. Uh, with us today to discuss VenturePoint Diagnostics and the company's recent highlights, as usual, is Dr. George Adams, the company's uh, executive chairman and CEO. We also have Elvira Makinovic, uh, the company's VP of Operations, Regulatory Affairs, Quality Assurance, George's right-hand person. He speaks very highly of Elvira and her contributions to the company. And Dr. Mark Swain, who works closely with Torrey Hills Capital and is the editor of Biopub, a subscription website focused on undervalued biotech and medical device situations. Welcome to you all. It's great to have you on. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you. Um, so George, our viewers are familiar with VenturePoint, obviously. So um, I think if we follow the same format as last time, where you could give a brief overview of the company, and then we can really focus on um, the, the seven or eight specific key developments that have happened with the company, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, and so for our viewers, before we get started, and I turn it over to George, uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, just please type your question into the Q&A box and we'll make sure it gets answered. We'll try to get to all of them today. We usually have a lot of questions. Uh, so with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to George Adams. George, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anthony, for the nice introduction. Good to see you, Mark and Alvira. Here. So I'm going to, uh, you know, this is where the stock has been up and down a bit there. I mean, the major event this happened since the last Tory Hills uh, session we had was that these 50 cent warrants uh, have expired. So now we have essentially no warrant uh, overhang and the stock has been going, doing its usual down in, you know, sell in May guys and go away are been doing their thing. And that seems to have, now we're out of May, we're into June, that seems to have come back to normal. So we're, that's basically, uh, I, the only other upgrade on the slide is that we now, because we did end up getting 33% of these warrants exercised. We now have three years of cash in the bank uh, and of course no debt. So that's uh, that's uh, the major change in the last two weeks or so. Uh, next slide, okay. So as you remember, Venture Point's all about using an artificial intelligence approach to, to calculate uh, the volume metric parameters of how a heart functions for all four chambers of the heart. And that product is approved in the United States, Canada, Europe, and China. We have 16 clinical sites using it. We have 11 more sites who want to get one. And now that COVID is starting to slow down because of the vaccination progress, uh, we're seeing those uh, hospitals activate, or those center, cardiac centers act, being active now. and and Elvira can give us an update on how, how we're doing in terms of getting those machines into those places. Um, the other major event that's happened in the last month is, that, of course, has been the uh, alliance that we struck with GE Healthcare to integrate our analytics uh, technique into their package uh, and offer it to their installed customer base. Uh, GE, I will go through a few numbers on GE so you can get an idea how big an opportunity that is and that even a small percentage of uh, GE's base would overwhelm 
uh, us in terms of revenue and not overwhelm us, but would, would catapult us into another category altogether in terms of revenue and uh, awareness in the marketplace. George, uh, something, if I could interject something I said to Biopub people is that, you know, how do you put valuation and, and price on writing in wet concrete the way you're doing on permanence, the way you've established where you've, you've given us a methodology for imaging a critical part of the heart where there was no viable, routinely usable methodology. And, and you know, as soon as I kind of asked that metaphorical question, the answer came in the form of the GE. <laughs> That's how you value it. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I think the big message about the GE partnership uh, is that, you know, GE wouldn't be partnering with us if we didn't have something that they didn't have. And they wouldn't be gearing up for their installed customer base if they didn't, if they had something that would do what we do. And they don't. So, you know, that to me, you know, I've had to feel that question for 10 years, you know, why, why doesn't GE or Siemens and Phillips do this? I mean, why don't they just gear up and figure out how to do this and, and put it in their packages? If, and, and the answer is because it's not easy and it's taken us 10 years to get it right. And they look at it and I'm not, they don't want to spend 10 years trying to reproduce it. They just said, fine, let's just partner and get it, get it going here. And so yeah. that was the right decision because as you know, Patients need, you know, doctors need this information about their patients. They haven't been able to access, especially right ventricular function or right atrial, left atrial function. And uh, yeah, and, and you know, they haven't been able to, they know they need it. They haven't been able to get it. Why wait another 10 years until GE Phelps or Siemens finally figure out how to do it? We already know how to do it. So it, it was the right decision. It was an easy I think it was an easy call by GE to say, yeah, let's just go ahead and get this done. It's, and it gives them, it's given the company huge credibility and very soon, I hope, will give us huge reach into the marketplace. Because, you know, GE, you know, um, collaboration, the warrants have expired. Uh, we got a Canadian government grant that we announced for the 4D analysis and 4D is motion analysis. I mean, if you go into the internet and you, and you look up 4D ultrasound, you'll find that, yes, it exists. Sometimes they call it real time 3D. Sometimes they call it 4D. Sometimes they, but the bottom, the, the kind of 4D we're talking about here is motion analysis, not just beating heart. Oh, look at the pretty beating heart. That's a 4D ultrasound. No, that's, you know, looking at a pretty beating heart isn't, isn't going to get you anywhere in terms of understanding how, what's wrong with the heart or the patient. You have to do some detailed kinetic analysis, motion analysis on that heart. And so that's the part that we filed a patent on. It's the part that we got a grant from the government on. And it's the part that, you know, frankly, we're going to collaborate a bit with GE on to, um, really figure out what parts of, uh, you know, how, what's the best way to move, to, you know, characterize the movement of a heart. You know, that's it. Uh, we've also put some white papers up on the web website from users, longtime users. So you can go and read about how they've used our system to really impact their patient population. And we've you know, been to two echo conferences now they're virtual still, uh, I think Euro, Euro Echo this year, which will happen in the fall, I think is, is going to be a real conference, not a virtual one. Is that right, Alvira? You're, you're muted, Alvira. <laughs> so I don't know. Anthony, do you need to unmute Alvira? Or could she no, I muted you? myself. <laughs> um, we don't know, actually. So we're waiting to, to hear whether it'll be an in-person or a uh, virtual conference. I think them. Um, there's a couple of conferences that are like that. Uh, nobody knows just yet. I think everyone's just sort of in a wait and see uh, pattern to see how this um, COVID-19 unfolds for the next few months. We're getting close, but okay. All no right. way of All knowing. Right. <laughs> uh, by the way, so there's, you know, there's two major conferences in the space, uh, the American Society for Echocardiography, which happens um, usually about now, and, and then the Euro Echo one in, in the fall in the fourth quarter and uh, in Europe. And so we really wanna have an impact at that Euro Echo. Uh, Dr. Monahan, who's the, has one of our machines at King's College in London is the convener of that conference. So he, he's the head guy. So we, we anticipate having a, a good, a good impact there. Uh, hopefully they'll be able to do it 
in you know really live um at least for people who are double vaccinated right as of july, july the first if you've got both vaccines you're fully vaccinated you can go to europe <laughs> that's what they just announced so uh, all right so that's that that's a good you know it's a good indicator that they're beginning to open up the world i know on the front page of the of the Globe and Mail in Canada this morning was a picture of everybody sitting around at the foot of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, <laughs> picnic kicking at the foot of the Eiffel Tower, so, saying, we're open, come and visit us. <laughs> That's good news for us because it means COVID is, you know, that means the hospitals can start going back to being normal and we can get these machines that we, we know everybody wants uh, in there into the, some more key, key locations. And lastly, we've been working on identifying other uh, le left-sided heart opportunities. And if we get a chance today, we can talk about that, but that's kind of the next generation development projects as, not, as opposed to uh, getting the product out the door. So uh, Alvira, why don't you talk to us about GE? You've uh, been the major interface with them. So why don't you go sure. ahead? Um, so, uh, we've been working obviously on um, a 3D echo uh, version of our, our of our software. Um, we've uh, made actually quite a bit of uh, new little uh, features uh, that we've added. Um, we are scheduled actually uh, to meet with them next week uh, at the end of the week um, to show them the latest and greatest that we've been working on. Um, it is pretty much complete. Um, it is going through now our uh, validation testing. And when once that is complete, then we will send it over to them and they will have to do their own uh, validation testing on their end. These are just uh, you know regulatory and quality assurance requirements uh, for any <laughs> medical device company. Um, but things are moving along quite nicely. Uh, we're actually uh, quite pleased with how the, how the um, software uh, turned out. Um, it is a nice complement uh, to what they do not currently have. Um, and so I think that's, you know, coming back to what George was saying, um, that's how, um, that is the reason why I think we were appealing uh, to them and they approached us uh, in the first place is uh, we have something that augments and complements um, what they don't currently have with their current offering, specifically with respect to the right ventricle. Okay, so that's where we're at. We're at the, you know, internally test it and show it to GE and get them to test it and then move on to the commercialization phase of it. Um, you know, GE is a big time, you know, they they already have imaging equipment in 160 countries. They have 4 million imaging devices worldwide. About 500,000 of those are ultrasound machines. So they, you know, they do x-ray machines, uh, MRIs, PETs, CAT scans, all sorts of different kinds of equipment. But uh, about 500,000 of those are uh, ultrasound machines. And uh, GE put out a, uh, a very interesting presentation. You can download from GE's website a very interesting presentation where they talk about their roadmap for the whole imaging business, including cardiac ultrasound and how they intend to move forward and, and bring new technology into that space and how they have been a technology innovator for the last hundred years in the, you know, since they started x-rays really. And, um, and so it's a very interesting presentation. So I will send, Anthony, I think you have that. I sent you that link, right? Or did I not? I don't believe I have it, no. Okay, well, I'll send you the link. Okay. And I think you should send it out to the people who have signed into the conference so they can go and look at it. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's a bit technical, but actually it's, it's kind of fun reading. And if you don't look at anything, just look at the one slide where they show you their innovation history in the imaging space and notice that in the last 10 years, there's been nothing, <laughs> nothing in ultrasound. <laughs> so, you know, all this innovation and then, you know, about what they've been innovating in the last 10 years is MRI, you know, better, better sensors, better things for x-ray, those kind of things. But ultrasound really haven't had anything new in 10 years to talk about. And so um, we are the new thing. And so we're pretty confident that GE is going to put 
uh, you know, a lot of effort into bringing out this new thing and their salespeople are super keen to get hit the road again now that COVID is under control and they're both, they've had their double vaccinations. And so we anticipate that uh, GE will uh, put a lot of effort into bringing this new stuff out. Um, what well, we will see. Um, so just to tell you a little bit more about 4D. Ooh, this is supposed to work. Oh yeah, there it goes. Uh, so, you know, because we, at the end of the, the routine analysis that we do on all four chambers of the heart, we end up with a complete mathematical model of the heart and, you know, in systole and in diastole. And so we can, we can now calculate anything you can imagine on what goes on with every, all four chambers of the heart and the whole heart in general uh, as a beating heart. And so these things are called tensors and, uh, and they, and we can, you know, can bundle those things up in, um, we have, I don't know, probably, probably a thousand different tensors that we get from, we can, we can calculate from within a uh, right ventricle. And so we can then bundle those up into regional tensors and give you an idea of how the heart is behaving in a regional manner. Uh, what happened here? Stop beating. Okay. Uh, and so you can see by looking at this right ventricle here that's beating that, you know, most of the pumping action is come from the, it's shortening from the top down as opposed from the bottom up. And that's, uh, you know, and that changes when, you know, when, uh, when you have a condition and we'd like to do more of that to really understand exactly which conditions causes this change in different ways. But we know from in pulmonary hypertension that when you, you know the heart enlarges slightly due to the, to the high blood pressure on the right side of the heart, and you end up with a bulge between at the back between the two uh, the valves, and you also end up with a little kick at the as the, the last end of the cardiac cycle. You get the, the the apex gives you a little kick at the end, which is not normally there in normal heart function. So you can actually begin to diagnose things like pulmonary hypertension by the mechanics of the heart, regional mechanics of the heart, as opposed to just size and shape. Uh, so Mark, I mean, we had to talk about that a little late, earlier and uh, that's kind of a new concept, I guess, in, in cardiac. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, and I know, yeah. Alvira, you've been working with a, a panel of top cardiologists. I mean, add a little color to our, how 4D is coming. Sure. Um, so yeah, we've been working with a, a number of uh, KOLs actually um, from around the world, um, namely uh, Canada, United States, um, Europe, uh, to develop out this technology. And, and one of the things that's very striking is every time uh, we show them this uh, this tensor technology, their eyes just light up with the uh, the possibilities of how they can uh, use it. Because um, as George. Uh, mentioned, uh, as well as Mark, um, there isn't anything really out there for RV that gives you these, these tensors, which are this magnitude and direction that allows you to see this uh, wall motion. So not only are, are we able to provide them with numbers, um, but also something that's a bit more qualitative um, that, they can, that, that they can view on, on the screen um, as well. Um, what we are hearing from them is there's different types of diseases and disorders where there's just information isn't available uh, to them that they can actually see the potential uh, with the tensor uh, technology. So um, as you know, we did file a, a patent application and there's a number of different um, calculations, if you will, uh, that, we, uh, that we can get uh, with this tensor technology, one of them being uh, things like global longitudinal strain, but from a 3D uh, perspective. Uh, which is a little bit different uh, than what traditionally um, they, they, they would have. And uh, the beauty of this is the input is our KBR um, algorithm, which um, has that accuracy uh, equivalent to MRI, which is different from anything that's out there because nobody has <laughs> our, what we have in, in terms of our technology and these MRI uh, catalogs uh, that we have. So, so there's a huge so the, the tensors Sorry? are being placed there, I mean, they're not, obviously they're not in the real world being, you know, thumbtacks into the heart, but they're being placed there by AI interpretal, you know, interpolation algorithms, right, that, that 
would have to be extraordinarily sophisticated to, to generate what you're seeing there. And I guess kind of where I'm going with this is how, how long did, you know, from the, from the idea of when this, from the point when the idea was first hatched, how much wall motion capture did you have to come up with to, to get you to, to, you know, where you got what we're seeing on, on screen now? Cause it, it really is very impressive. There's, a boatload of mathematical information in that. It's 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 a trove, really. Mm -hmm. So to put this in perspective, um, this is years <laughs> years of work uh, in, in the making. Um, this wasn't something that uh, obviously we put together overnight. Um, just to also explain it, um, with the LV, we have what we call these polar maps. So there's the segmentation pattern that's already been figured out. It's part of the traditional. Um, medicine, but this uh, particular one for right ventricle, nobody's done it. Um, so we are actually paving a new way, a new approach uh, for clinicians because we are creating these segmentation patterns um, that these tensors are, are part of. Um, it, it allows them to hone in on particular segments if they if they want to. Um, but uh, yeah, to answer your question, Mark, it, it was years. Um, in the making. Um, it's something that we've been working on for the last about, about three years now. Okay, so that was uh, kind of fun. Um, so as you know, we've uh, keep pushing ahead on uh, congenital heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, COVID and, and cardiotoxic effects of chemotherapy. Uh, I don't know, there's, you know, those are all right ventricular, right heart, issues uh, and that's where we are absolutely unique and be able to calculate accurate, reliable volumes, uh, injection fractions and now motion. Uh, so we've been, you know, that's, that's uh, we continue to build awareness in those spaces and build it out. COVID-19 is obviously the biggest unknown right now. It's the biggest concern in the cardiology department world about long-term long-haul COVID patients and how much heart disease they have acutely and how, and, and there's now been a couple of papers put out uh, showing that, uh, you know, even if you have mild symptoms and you may not even go to the hospital, you may end up, end up back in the hospital in three months later with a big heart problem. That's just sort of how long it's taken your heart to um, be damaged by the initial cytokine uh, storm that comes with COVID, you know, so even if you're not all that sick and, and the vir virus just gets into your heart and creates a whole lot of inflammation uh, over a period of two or three months, that inflammation can turn into heart disease. And now you end up in the hospital with a heart failure and not, uh, and not respiratory distress. So that's a lot of people are seeing that. So, and, and quite a few people actually, I think the last paper I saw showed that about um, 10 to 12 percent of those people actually died in hospital who were, you know, who hadn't had major symptoms in the initial uh, onset of the disease, but subsequently three months later ended up in the hospital and about, and some of them are, are dying. So that's, uh, there's a lot more than we need to understand about what COVID does to the heart. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, Dr. Monaghan at King's College in London, who says, you know, epicenter of the UK, that's not UK variant anymore, it's the alpha variant of uh, COVID is, has a machine and he's using it on COVID patients. So I look for, for we are gonna get some interesting information about right heart function in the, in the context of COVID, both acutely and chronically. So interesting. Um, let's talk about the, uh, the slides sort of remind me, Alvira talk about uh, the what's going on in in the people who are expecting to get a, who want a machine and who have been sort of stymied by the cold by the fact that the echocardiography services have been shut down. They've been worldwide for the last year. They've been running at under twenty percent capacity. Um, so, what are you hearing from your from those folks? Mm -hmm. um, so, I just had a conversation actually earlier this uh, week uh, with um, with an individual out of the UK. And um, there they are still, although things are improving, um, the hospitals still are on in their lockdowns. Um, so having outside personnel uh, come in on, on site is still not possible 
um, at this time. And the hope is uh, within the next couple of months that that will open up. Uh, but once again, it's this wait and see um, how things go. Um, so unfortunately, uh, with the UK, um, well, fortunately, we are able to do uh, remote installations um, and training. So that, that is what we are doing with uh, the unit that's uh, destined uh, for Glenfield. And they are quite pleased to be getting their, their unit. <laughs> Um, as well as um, Erasmus, for example, they are up and running. We did remote um, installation and, and training. And so they are currently uh, using uh, the system. Uh, so um, we, you know, we had to, at the beginning of all of this, we had to pivot as, as everyone knows, um, and we had to find another way to get our systems into these, these hospitals. And the same thing with MD Anderson, we did a remote installation and, and, and training. Um, Generally, what we are hearing is things are starting to open up, but they are opening up uh, slowly and cautiously. Um, so that's really all I have. What about the U.S.? I mean, we have a bunch of people in the U.S. who are, you know, being uh, frustrated not being able to get their administration to say, yes, okay, get it in here. You're, you're, you know, they've been saying, no, no, wait, wait till things are more normal. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that starting to open up as well? Or is it just- That is, that is. We've actually got a, a, a few units already. Um, that are, are waiting for their new homes. <laughs> so that will be happening. <laughs> that will be happening soon. They will be leaving uh, Venture Point. Uh, we've got one uh, that should be shipping out actually next week um, to, the, to, the uh, to a major hospital. So yeah, but we'll be doing remote installations and training still going forward uh, because once again, non-essential uh, personnel um, aren't really being admitted into the hospitals even for servicing, um, they're trying to do everything remotely if they can. Okay. Um, I guess we'll, uh, we can talk about, let, let's stop there, Al Anthony, you probably have some questions. So let's, let's yeah. uh, start oh, going, working on the questions here. Yeah, we're gonna, um, you know, I just want to kind of go through um, each of these developments. And, and I know that you spoke, you, you spoke about them um, throughout the, presentation, but maybe you could shed a little bit more light on them uh, in terms of, you know, what's happened um, with the company over the last seven months. You know, I have a lot of questions are pertaining to, you know, shareholder value. Obviously, people are, you know, a little disappointed that the stock has kind of drifted down, especially after that great uh, announcement with, um, with GE. Um, but, you know, I think if you look at the the company in terms of its long-term um, prospects and all the things that have happened with the company, especially over the last seven months to uh, really set it up for long-term success. I just want to kind of tackle each one. First, first uh, one being the balance sheet in capital, capitalization. Um, so when we first started working with you, George, you had an eight-month runway and um, you had uh, you know, some, some debt, uh, can you talk about the balance sheet, how long you have in terms of, um, you know, uh, capital? And if you, if you see the need for more capital down the road uh, and how you, would, how you would plan to address that? Uh, yeah, we've come a long way. I mean, obviously, uh, less than a year ago, we had about, about $3 million in convertible debt. We had, uh, you know, 25 million warrants out, outstanding between 10 and 50 cents. We had, you know, just enough money to open to keep running. We had, you know, had about six months of runway and, and, and we had about a million dollars in uh, payables. So, you know, we were a long way down. So now we are ahead. We have no debt. We have three years worth of cash in the bank. So if I don't, we don't sell a machine for three years, can't imagine that, but anyway, if, if mm -hmm. that happened, we, we keep functioning at our current burn rate for three years. We obviously, you know, are going to start selling and getting revenue. And these are high mar it's a high margin business. As you know, we, we produce the machines for $5,000. We sell them for 50,000 or we lease them out for a, you know, what we would anticipate being somewhere between a 50 to $65,000 a year recurring revenue. Um, so, you know, it's a high margin business. Uh, there's no reason why we can't grow it quickly just from uh, revenues. 
and GE being our partner with GE when they hit the ground running and, and start pushing the, uh, the product out into their customer base. As I said, they have 500,000 people with a GE ultrasound machine. Now, not all of those are cardiac ultrasound machines and we're still working with, with GE to sort of segment out that market and figure out exactly what the, what the uh, sales uh, forecast should be in, in starting in the United States and then Europe and then the rest of the world. But, uh, you know, it's a big number. I mean, even a small fraction of, let's say, can't see me when it does that thing. Move this up. Uh, even a small fraction of GE's installed base, like a, a 5% fraction would be, uh, you know, a, uh, a billion dollars worth of business. So, I mean, they do, you, you, when you look at that uh, roadmap that they produced, uh, uh, after this, you'll see that, you know, they break it down. And I think they do about seven or $8 billion a year in cardiac ultrasound equipment. So, you know, it's, it's a, you know, a small fraction of their business is a huge number to us. Uh, so um, that's where our balance sheet is now. We're in good, very excellent shape. I mean, I have a fellow CEOs and biotech med tech companies are, would die to be in our position with the liquidity we have, you know, we're still trading. Yes. Three, three, four hundred thousand dollars a day in stock. Uh, we have three years of cash in the bank, uh, you know, and nothing but opportunity in front of us. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty lucky. I think we're pretty, uh, pretty satisfied where we got to in under a year. Yeah. And um, you know, I think some, some of the um, maybe investors have missed the fact that um, there was some insider buying. Uh, you know, at levels higher than where the stock is trading at now. Can you talk a little bit about the insider buying and um, and and, uh, and kind of you know what that means for? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, we were doing this GE agreement, right? <laughs> we, yeah, and you know, heard this is my seventh time around. I sold my company to Pfizer, and I, you know, I've been part of Dupont and Pfizer and Boston Scientific, and and you know consulted the Siva Geigy and other big companies. So, you know, big companies move slowly. That's just the way it is, right? So obviously we've been, we were negotiating this thing with GE. Alvira, how long were we at this? Nine months, six months, at least, right? Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. So basically the insiders have been blacked out <laughs> and doing anything for six months. So finally we were able to actually go in the market and buy some. So yeah, there was about $200,000 for the stock that was purchased by insiders in the, between the 45 to 50 cent range in the last month or so. So yeah, I think that indicates to the market that we believe that it's nothing, you know, it's share prices were very undervalued and we're happy, you know, we as people are now free to buy it. And you know, now we actually have some other you know, part of the go forward plan here is to you know sign up more distributors because the GE deal is a non-exclusive and and even you know it's a it's not exclusive from a legal perspective but in, in fact I mean it's exclusive to their customers so once we can we get the product finished and and uh, it's only going to work for GE customers because it's, it's our system is going to be embedded in their existing analytics package so yeah not, so if you don't have a GE machine and you're not using their analytics package. Right. So that's, so GE's got 40% of the market. The other 60% is still out there. So we're going, we're now signing up distributors to go out there after that other 60% of the market uh, and uh, on a more conventional, you know, regional, you know, regional guys who are access to cardiologists and cardiology departments, uh, you know, in different regions. So uh, we signed one up this week, probably get a press release out of that, about that next week. And we've got, I think, Alvaro, um, we have, I know we interviewed somebody in Germany. How is that? Is that coming or what do you that think? Is, we're actually um, moving forward. So we've got uh, a meeting scheduled early uh, next week um, uh, to uh, move that forward even more so. There's a couple of other groups that we've engaged with. And, and that's well. a Right, and that's a significant existing distributor for cardiac, you know, cardiac echocardiography uh, products in Germany. Mm -hmm. so, so they've got all them. They've got access to the customer. And Germany, as I just told you, the whole of Europe is opening up on July the first. You know, those sales people will get back on the road in Germany as well, and start going to their customers. And so we're also uh, engaged uh, a firm in the UK 
mm -hmm. to find us or you know to screen through a number of distributors and, and give us their opinion on who's the best best group to work with. So we just keep at this one country after another, one region after another. I mean, the good news is, you know, that gets us to the other 60% of the market. It also is going to put some pressure on GE to get going. Because, <laughs> you know, if our, if our regional distributors are calling on partner uh, uh, customers, and you have to realize most echocardiography, you know, major echocardiography or services would have a GE and a Philips and a Siemens or, you know, maybe one or two or three or all three. Uh, there's very few shops out there that are pure GE or pure Philips or something. Uh, some of them may even have a Toshiba or a Panasonic or a Samsung or a, a Eserate. In Europe, Eserate actually, quite a, that's an Italian company. They're, they're pretty pretty big in Italy, actually. And, and so, um, you know, these distributors will be calling on the the people, uh, you know, the same customers that GE will be calling on, they're going to be calling based on the fact that they want to hook up a machine to their Philips machine or Philips device or whatever. So it's a, it's a good way to g keep GE honest, and it's a good way for us to address the other 60% of the market. So in other words, other distribution agreements are, are coming down the pipeline. They're coming, they're coming as, <laughs> they're not huge, you know, <laughs> hundred and fifty billion dollar companies like GE. They actually can they get off the phone. No, but you're you're expanding the footprint throughout the world, which is great. Yeah, no, yeah. It's not gonna take nine months or six yeah. months to do a deal with a distributor. No. So unfortunately, um, you know, with COVID, um, you know, we've had an issue where you guys have been unable to get into, you know, hospitals for the longest time because COVID was was obviously the um, you know, the main focus for a lot of these doctors. And so, you know, uh, looking at, uh, you know, buying new machinery was, you know, unless it was related to COVID was not something that was being, was being um, considered. But one thing that did come out of COVID was a new market opportunity. And that was uh, for COVID long haulers who are suffering from cardiovascular risk. You know, how much do you think that will grow the company? Because we are seeing a lot of people with major um, cardiovascular issues, um, you know, after they've kind of weathered the COVID storm, uh, so to speak. Uh, I don't know, I guess, Mark, that's kind of up your bailey rack, Mark. What do you, you know, let me take a shot at that one. <laughs> so no, look I at your crystal ball and say, how important is right heart analysis in COVID, acute and chronic COVID? Yeah. I think I think acutely it is. I mean, I, I don't want to be a party pooper, George. I, having read several longer term, you know, more thorough synopses of what's being labeled long COVID, I don't get I don't get tomatoes lobbed at me for saying this. I'm concerned it's PTSD oh. because there there aren't biological marker. You know, Cook's postulates are not being fulfilled, right? Mm. There aren't biological markers, and yet there are many many of the hallmarks of you know, of post-war trauma syndrome, shell shock, you know, war heart, this kind of thing, the, the, the same kinds of malaises that soldiers come home from the battlefield with. And we have to remember these are, you know, human beings susceptible to, to meme implantation and watching something horrifying on the television, you know, come real and come and infect them and alter the course of their reality. And there's no way to get over that. It, it implants itself in your amygdala, your brain starts to dysregulate itself, and it's not simply a matter of psychotherapy to get rid of it. It, re it really isn't, and I have I have great sympathy for those patients. But you know, I, I do think it's important to maybe recognize the part of the body where it's housed, and it, it maybe maybe brain, you know, in a in, in the figurative sense, and not 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 body really. That, that's that's my opinion. Just that's based on a fair amount of reading. I'm not sure the long COVID thing is gonna show us something. Now, having said that, there's no question that some of the the people who have a rough acute time with COVID, even if they survive, get pulmonary fibrosis, are gonna have RV changes as evinced by your methodology. And, you know, uh, woe unto them, you know, they face a future without the ability to image that side of the heart as you've provided. I think it's a great thing. And, 
you know, the, this, we don't know what the natural history of it is. And you've, you've given us a tool to track that. And, and, you know, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to regroup, reconvene in five, 10 years and sort of see what new concepts, you know, your system has left us with. You've talked a lot about the, the atrial size and hypertension concept. That's a new concept, George. I think, I mean, let's, but it is, that's a major concept, don't you think? Oh, no, I'm very excited about the concept of it. I mean, think, think how massively that applies to North Americans, and we're not even, you know, routinely assessing it. And so I, I just think that for every notion like that, there are 10 latent others that need to be, you know, explored, and none of it, and it sounds like I'm apple polishing here, but I, I just think you've accomplished a major thing we've seen history get made by watching this story and it's ensconced history already it ain't going to go away somebody is not going to come along and suddenly do it better i don't think and you know you're going to leave us with a bunch of new concepts new eponyms new labels new you know new uh, uh new new ideas for you know pathophysiology and we're not trying to revel in mayhem here by sort of celebrating how people get sick we're trying to find ways they go wrong and fix those and avert those, you know, so. Well, that's right. And I think we kind of lose track of the fact that you know, one of the big advantages of the measure point is that you're using conventional 2D ultrasound. And it's yes. very quick and very unintrusive and the patient can move around while you're collecting the images and, and you can have the analysis done right there at the bedside while the patient's sitting there. And, that, you know, I mean, almost everywhere in the world that, you know, they have to, patient goes away and someone goes in a dark room and looks at the images for a while and scratches their head and says, I think this is what's going on. And, you know, two days later, the, the patient gets a, a phone call saying, I think you have <laughs> whatever. <it's Right>. Right. <laughs> we should have admitted you. We shouldn't have sent you home, whatever. Uh, you know, so it's, and, and, and that translates, that ease of use and accuracy and immediacy translates into more frequent uh, assessment of patients. And we sure. know in pulmonary hypertension and in conventional congenital heart disease, and I'm going to predict in COVID, that you know, leaving the patient for a year or two years between cardiac exams is a recipe for disaster. We know yeah. that you can go from having a more or less, you know, a heart that's under, under a little bit of, with a little bit of hypertension, pulmonary hypertension with a heart that's coping quite well with it, to one that was absolutely, you know, doubled in size and can barely function in less than six months. So if you're only looking at your patients every year, you know, you basically have wasted six months or maybe even sure. nine, I agree. nine months of therapeutic intervention when the heart is starting to go. Uh, really struggle with the pulmonary hypertension and whether it's fibrosis from, from COVID or whether it's, you know, a conventional um, pulmonary hypertension uh, onset. Um, you know, but when a new way to ask a question comes about and, and a new facile way of answering the question comes about, you can't, you know, dodo bird yourself and, you know, bury your head in the sand and say, you know, I'm not going to move forward with this. I mean, you're, you're, you're crazy if you, if you don't. And, and, you know, what I would say is going on, and especially in the, you know, higher echelon kind of academically inclined centers, you know, is that is cardiology FOMO, fear of missing out. Yeah. You know, if you don't have the system, you've got to have the system and you've got to be using it. And, that, and that's just, that's a, that's not jumping on a bandwagon. I think that's a healthy thing. This kind of imaging doesn't harm people. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't give them radiation or anything like that. And, and, you know, what's to say that, you know, great, uh, great things are in store for, you know, a, a new round of understanding of the right heart, which is so terribly different from the left heart. I mean, they're barely deserving of being called halves of the same organ. Their physiologies are so radically different on the two sides. And we've always just simply assumed we kind of got what went on on the right when the fact is, I don't think we've had a clue. No, I, I mean, if you read the reviews, everybody is now agreeing that you know, what we know about the right heart is so in its infancy, for sure. Dark side of the moon. I will just go back because, I mean, Anthony's question was about COVID. So, Anthony, the only thing I think I'll say is, you know, we had SARS, which was an earlier form of COVID. 15 years ago, 10% of the people who got SARS you know, still have chronic heart and lung problems, the ones that are still alive. So, uh -huh. you know, I mean, yeah, I agree with you, Mark, that 
probably a lot of the patients get the brain fog and PTSD and that kind of, you know, that malaise that kicks in. Uh, but there's still going to be probably five or 10% people who are going to have heart problems. And those are the ones that we're going to be able to address and help and monitor more closely and get the, get intervention done more appropriately. Uh, and on top of the CHD and pH and everything else. Um, so that, Mark, uh, Anthony, I think that's where I see it yeah, going. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I sure hope they figure out how to fix the brain fog. <laughs> in yeah. Period, but, uh, you know, they'll, they will. George, I was, I was Ubering it across town the other day because the car was in the shop and the, the woman who was my Uber driver was notably gasping or sort of clipped sentences I thought she was a COPD patient. And then she let on that in December she had had COVID, had been at Duke Hospital, and it had. They're basically they were basically saying that you know we think you're devolving. We think probably tonight you're gonna have to you know, you know you know where I'm headed with this. And then she she steer, veered off from that at the last minute. Was never intubated and kind of you know made some recovery. But I'm like you know, you wanted I wanted to step out of the proscenium arch and say I know that at Duke Hospital they've got the imaging system and you need to have your right heart imaged. I mean, yeah. she does. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You know, well, hey, Anthony, a, let's get back to some other questions here. Yeah, <laughs> no, right. no, and that was the point yeah. I was I really wanted to um, drive home is that I think there will be um, a tremendous opportunity, uh, you know, for 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 those um, who will suffer long term um, issues with with COVID. Uh, Elvira, can you maybe talk about, you talked about the validation testing um, with GE. Uh, can you talk about how that's moving along and a timeline kind of for when you see the move from validation testing to the, to the next step? So that's, uh, that's imminent, actually. Um, it's very timely <laughs> that you're asking about that. I have a, a project meeting actually with the team uh, this afternoon. Uh, okay. to go over that in the plan. Um, one thing that people need to appreciate uh, that are unfamiliar with, with software development is that testing is quite um, extensive. So we test every single feature, every button, every, um, every screen uh, that the user sees to make sure that the functionality is there. So we do what we call verification and validation testing. So in the verification testing, we, we need to make sure that, we're, that we've made the, uh, the product correctly so that every feature that we said that it needs to meet a certain requirement, that it meets that requirement. In the validation testing, uh, we're testing to make sure that we made the right uh, product so that it meets the uh, user needs. Um, so all of this is uh, you know, highly regulated and, and highly quality uh, controlled. So it is quite an extensive uh, process. It's not something that takes months to do. Uh, but it's definitely um, in, in the form of, of weeks um, to do with, with multiple uh, testers and uh, actually using um, users in the field as well. Um, uh, just to put that into a perspective <laughs> for everyone, uh, but it, is, uh, it, it will be starting. Uh, we have actually started to put in uh, preparation uh, for it, but it is, it is an effort um, to do it with any uh, medical device, software, hardware, all of it. Yeah, so um, once that validation um, testing is done, um, you know, we, uh, what are we talking about in terms of a timeline? I know that, you know, you're working with a, an extremely large company, so things don't always go, um, you know, they can sometimes move at a slow pace. But, um, you know, in terms of training, boots on the ground, going into hospitals, um, you know, what can you can you talk about maybe when you think that might happen? Sure. So, I mean, it, it comes down to the, the quality of the product. So we, we do take a lot of, um, we do take time and we put a lot of effort into making sure that that product is perfection uh, before we hand it over um, to GE. So once it does go over, I anticipate that, that their testing should move relatively quickly. However, um, it is a larger company. They have their own uh, timeline. There's only so much uh, we can push from our end, but uh, we are doing everything on our end uh, to make sure that that product is, is ready for them and that there shouldn't be um, any bugs or issues um, when they start their, their testing. Um, 
we are speaking to them regularly. They are working through things on, on, on their end. Um, unfortunately, I can't share all of the specific uh, details, uh, but um, like I said, we are meeting with them this week. Um, we, uh, we have uh, scheduled for every month um, for updates to speak to them. So um, I, I know that doesn't answer your, uh, your question entirely, Anthony, um, but like I said, we are doing everything on our end uh, to push it push it forward. They are doing everything on their end uh, to, to push it forward. Uh, we are really actually working uh, very well um, together. It's a strong team on their end. It's a strong team, I believe, on our end. I'm a little biased. Uh, mm-hmm. But, um, you know, like I said, the collaboration is there. It is a, it, you know, their words, it is a strong uh, collaboration between the Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the important thing is, is um, you're making progress. Um, we are. It seems like you know, pretty steadily. So that's great. I'm going to read some questions. George, uh, George, with all your big pharma experience, what do you think the tipping point will be for you to be taken over? And does GE have any advantage in that regard embedded in your deal? Uh, no, there's no specific uh, advantage to GE in the deal. They, but they do have an advantage in the sense that they're going to be our marketing partner. So they'll see the adoption curve of the product as it comes out. Uh, you know, and if you know, they will see how fast people adopt it. And you heard Mark say FOMO is going to kick in here <laughs> pretty quickly. <Yep. laughs> and, you know, and, you know, we are starting in the United States where FOMO is, you know, hospitals yeah, compete with each other, you know, they're across the street from each other, but they compete for each other for, for patients and for doctors and, you know, and I know, you know, there's, as you probably read, there's a, you know, almost a global shortage of hospital staff, uh, hospitals mm-hmm. can't hire anybody. So, you know, if you're a cardiologist and you're trying to do good in the world and the hospital across the street's got one of our machines and you know that's what you need to do a good job on your patients, you're more inclined to move across the street. And so any, not only is it a competitive, it will be a competitive advantage to get patients, but you're, it's going to be a competitive advantage to get staff. So I think when that kicks in, it'll be, you know, GE will see it first. And uh, there's no specific, but I suspect they'll be the first people to step up and say, okay, we're not giving you the lion's share of this revenue. We can see this revenue curve taking off and we're just going to own it. Thank you very much. So yeah. nothing I can do about it. I'm a public company. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you can come up tomorrow and offer all my shareholders whatever price they want to offer them. And the shareholders can say yes or no. I mean, there's nothing. You know, if I was a private company, I'd have some capability of putting, in, you know, saying no, this is too cheap, don't do it now. But as a public company, there's nothing I can do about it except, you know, as a board, we can recommend taking the offer or not. Well, obviously, if we get an offer, we'll immediately hire some investment bankers who are, we know well and go get other offers from the other key people Siemens, Philips, uh, Toshiba, Panasonic. Samsung, uh, Fuji, and see if there's any, we can get an auction going, but uh, yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's the role of the board is to attempt to find, get that, uh, the best value for the ship company once it's in play. So I think it'll be in play. I've said, you know, without GE there, uh, well, GE jumping, <laughs> you know, yeah. jumping ahead, uh, I, you know, I've said 80 to 100 machines, which should be middle of the next year is the normal um, tipping point, which was your question. Where's the tipping point? So Yeah, and you know, obviously um, COVID has probably put you guys a year behind where you would probably would have been, you know, so. Um, yeah, you know, and I think GE will pull us, you know, pull us ahead a quarter or two, yeah. you, know, you know, get us back to being only six months or so behind, but that For remains. Sure. George, I've heard GE has an MO of two years of due diligence, you know, of pondering a takeover. You, you may have heard that too. I don't know if it's factual, but I don't know if it's a matter of policy, but, you know, supposedly that clock is running, you know, so. Yeah. Well, they they also have a history of overpaying for things they want to buy. Yes. Right? <laughs> and so, um, you know, they, you know, they don't, you know, typically value companies at, you know, multiples of top line revenue. If you can imagine, you know, so because they actually value it. I talked to the guys in acquisitions at GE and uh, they said they value it based on the revenue that they expect to get in the first year once they're fully operational with the product. Okay. Okay. 
So, so in their mind, that's not overvaluing the company. They're saying, hey, yeah, yeah maybe, maybe you're selling 10 million worth of product today, but when GE Force kicked in and you know, selling your product, we'd be selling $100 million a year. Yeah. Therefore, we're going to bid $100 million for your company because that, you know, we're going to sell your product for the next 10 years. So we're going to make a lot more money than that uh, right. on it. And that's how they value it, um, which is yeah, pretty sophisticated. I mean, that's how, you know, when I was part of Pfizer, we evaluated opportunities on the peak revenue curve, right? And then, you know, we would figure out what the adoption curve would be. We'd figure out the peak revenue. No one knows when that technology and drug, whatever is going to get displaced from the marketplace. So you can't really, but you go out there, you figure out how fast the adoption curve, you figure where the peak is. If the peak is, you know, $500 million a year, you do a discounted cash value back to what you've got today. And that's how you value the company you know, at peak peak revenue, right? So GE does it a slightly different way. Um, uh, but, uh, I, I, you know, it, it, there's no fixed timeline on it. I mean, I would say six, six months in when I was part of Pfizer, six months would have been a pretty quick deal. Uh, it, the due diligence, I mean, when Pfizer bought my company, the due diligence went on for six, eight weeks. Uh, after we signed the term sheet for them to acquire us. So the due diligence happens after you do the deal. And, yeah. you know, it takes a couple of, you know, if you look at the market, you'll see that, you know, you know, GE has a, a made an offer to buy this company. They've accepted it. The deal should close in three to four months. <laughs> That's when the due diligence gets done, not. <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, you know how, how long is it going to take to cut a deal? You know, it, and that's the, that's the variable, not the due diligence part. Yeah. Um, we're getting close to the, I want to get two more questions in. Um, so George, if you might, if, if you um, can answer these. Um, so one question is, can this tensor algorithm be used with other organs, um, aortic function, a tonic bladder, a tonic colon or stomach, arterial stiffness and hypertension, you know, brain ventricular, ultrasound, liver for cirrhosis, any, you know, do you see that being able to be used in other um, in other organs? Yes, of course. I mean, what do we do? We, we, we take simple 2D images and we create 3D models and tell you how the motion of that thing. So whether it's a, a liver fibrosis, uh, you know, affecting them, you know, the function of the liver motion and liver or whether it's growing, measuring it, you know, an accurate way to measure the growth of a, of um, liver cancer, uh, a nodule is something we could easily do. You know, triple A, you know, triple A's another one, aortic aneurysms, you know, it's very important to get those things nailed down exactly what their size is and how fast they're growing uh, because that determines the, when you go in there and do the surgery. I mean, you know, a ruptured triple A is virtually guaranteed death. Uh, so <laughs> you don't want to right. let it go large enough to rupture. Uh, Fourier transform analysis, George, of tensor motion, you know, analogs for, you know, arterial pulsations have been used to, to come up with models of non-invasive blood pressure monitoring. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do it yes. more we, I, you know, the new tracking system we created is actually more accurate than the old one. And so we have the ability to be very precise in terms of measuring uh, motion and and so and, and location. Uh, we haven't looked. We we got our hands full just dealing with cardiac right now, so uh, we haven't looked at any of those other applications. I, uh, you know, I would. Hey, if there's anybody out there who wants to license the technology and go after one of those things, give me a call. Yeah. For sure. And so, and one last thing, uh, because it was, uh, you know, a highlight um, over the last, you know, several months, um, can, is there any new progress with the China joint venture uh, with, with UTN, or is that still just kind of moving along? Um, you know, that's going to obviously be a huge market for VenturePoint um, once, you know, you get through any kind of regulatory, you know, um, hurdles over there, um, but is there anything that you can report? Well, we're through the regulatory. I mean, the the, the version version two, mm -hmm. what we call the BMS plus, uh, is 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 approved there for right vent right ventricular function, not for all four chambers, just right right ventricular function. 
Um, so they're rolling it out. You know, they're going through what the Chinese process to get it into all the hospitals. And, you know, and, uh, I really haven't had an update from them in about a month. So I don't really know what's happened, whether, you know, they were busy building up the distribution, getting their key hospital, getting the machines into key hospitals. Uh, they had uh, an opportunity to put one into the ICU, an ICU in Shanghai, major hospital ICU in Shanghai, because they wanted to use it for triage in COVID patients when they anticipated that the next wave, you know, they were going to get hit with a alpha, beta, gamma, delta variant that would show up in China and they would be into a needing a triage type op operation. I think there was a paper published about two weeks ago talking about twist and the fact that not only right ventricular volume is correlated to mortality in, in acute COVID uh, and, and has been suggested to be a good way to triage patients in ICUs so you can make sure the ventilator is being used efficiently. But now they're saying twist is also a very effective measurement. So that fits right into our 4D motion analysis thing because the heart actually does twist when it beats. And so if it's if it's under a lot of stress, it can't twist as much. And so by measuring the degree of twist, you can even get a better, and marrying that up with right ventricular size, you can get a better idea whether this patient is going to make it or not, and whether it's time to take take that ventilator and use it on somebody with a better chance. So, uh, so that's some of that's going on in China. Yep. Yeah, that should be, um, once that gets rolled out, that should be a great source of revenue for the company. Um, we're going to leave it there. George, would you mind scrolling to the last slide deck with the contact information, please? Uh, yeah. um, so uh, I want to thank George, Elvira, and Mark um, for coming on today. We really appreciate you get uh, getting us up to speed on um, Venture Point's lead product and obviously milestones and update with, uh, you know, with, with, Gen with GE and, and everything else all the other exciting news that's happening with the company. Um, and we look forward to having you on again in the future uh, to, you know, discuss more. Maybe we'll have some announcements between now and the next time we meet, but uh, I really want to thank you, uh, you all for, for coming on today. You're welcome. Thank you, we'll be having your MyPub as a webcast again soon. And the audience is more than welcome to attend that as well. So. Yeah, I think uh, we'll, that. And we'll send out that notice to everybody when we get the date finally. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and that's going to be exciting because I believe they're going to have a doctor on there who's actually using um, Venture Point's um, system on there, and, and it'll be, I think, a really informative uh, presentation. So uh, in the meantime, um, all our viewers, you, you can get additional information on Venture Point Diagnostics at the company's website at VenturePoint.com including details on the three VMS 3.0 system, as well as additional information and press releases. And I want to thank everybody, all of our participants who joined us today, um, you know, for taking the time to get up to speed on VenturePoint. And we look forward to your attendance on a future podcast. Again, if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to me at Torrey Hills Capital, uh, Jonathan Robertson at Oaks Hill Financial or George directly. Be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, but until then, until the next one, everyone be safe, be well. Thanks again, everyone. And, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Bye -bye. Anthony. Take Thanks, care.